right. Where are we starting yes. today? The modern, just the planning committee meeting. Yep, we're on chair. We need to be ready. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the general committee meeting. Um, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered here today. That's the Cubby Cubby or the Gubby Gubby people. Pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We have an apology from Mayor Claire Stewart. Um, may we have a, a confirmation of the minutes from the general committee meeting held on the 17th of May, please? Moved Councillor Finzel, seconded Councillor Stockwell. All those in favour? It's carried. We have no presentations or deputations, and we have items referred from committees, the first being an application for material change of use for short-term accommodation at 75 Williams Road, Kin Kin. Councillors, do you, would you like to ask more questions of staff? We have Patrick and Kerry here. Or would you like to move straight to the formal motion? Stunned silence or something. You stood up. It was Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone care to move a, a motion? Get things underway. We'll move your motion with any change. We we'll change. I'll, I'll yeah. move my motion. Yeah. Please. Councillor Lawrenson. Yep. Uh, and we have a seconder for that, please. I'll second for Seconded Councillor Finzel. Just, just to okay. clarify, could that's you, a motion with an addition. Could you read out the changes, please, um, Amelia? Um, I'd just like to add condition seven point one shall apply for 12 months after the commencement of use. This is in reference to the outdoor areas um, that are conditioned at the moment to be not to be used after 10 p.m. So I repeat, condition 7.1 shall apply for 12 months after the commencement of the use unless further extended by council in writing. After that time, if not extended by council in writing, condition 7.2 shall apply. 7.2 not to be used after 9 p.m. each night. Okay. Yeah, floor councillor Lawrence. Um, I've just added that condition. Um, I just had a couple of concerns that arose from just my questions at the planning and environment me meeting. Um, the report acknowledged that noise from outdoor areas can travel quite a significant distance in rural areas. Um, my, my concern is, is we actually don't know how far it travels and what the actual impact may be. Um, given that, that the approvals run with the land and not the person, um, which means that once it's given it can't be revoked, I just thought it's prudent that we trial the time for 12 months before giving it forever rights. Um, this condition is similar to the condition that I asked for the Sunshine Beach Surf Club. Um, and I think it, res it provides some consistency in our decision making and it also respects and acknowledges that the surrounding residents have a right of quiet enjoyment and that this amenity must be protected. Thank you. Question yeah. staff. Kerry, um, a condition like this, does it require the applicant to make, uh, uh, to apply to council uh, after 12 months for yes. the uh, extension in writing or does council uh, make that decision, will staff make that decision based on the fact that there have been no complaints or if there are complaints, it'll come back to council for decision? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the applicant would just be required to put a letter or an email in writing to mm -hmm. council making a request. It wouldn't require an application fee. Um, if there are no... Sorry, it will? It wouldn't require it. Won't, thank you. Um, if there were no complaints uh, received, officers would just um, agree to it without it coming back to council. If there were complaints received from residents in the area, officers would report it back to council for your consideration. Thank you for clarifying that understanding. Kerry, is it appropriate um, to have some type of advisory note where council um, notifies the applicant of that, that the 12 months <coughs> is due? Um, I'm just concerned that if the applicant hasn't made note of the 12 Question. month date um, that that might lapse? Um, look, I think it's really for the applicant to manage that. Okay. I don't think our systems have the capacity <laughs> to bring that up at this point in time. Okay, thank you. I have an Trust amendment. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add an additional condition and the condition would read um, environmental weeds in the biodiversity overlay area and within 10 metres either side of the map secondary waterway must be controlled by an active management program to the reasonable satisfaction of the council. 
A weed control management plan must be lodged with council for review. Possibly. Okay. Okay, Councillor Stockwell. Uh, I do so because the site has got um, a, a significant area at the rear of the property, which is in the biodiversity overlay, and I understand it's quite um, healthy vegetation, but it's also got a secondary waterway in the. Um, performance outcomes they are required to um, address uh, the overlay and at this stage there's no requirement other than uh, in the, these conditions so having looked at the site with staff on um, internet, it is very steep so it's probably not one where you would have uh, significant um, rehabilitation requirements it does look like a secondary waterway it has got some regrowth happening but there is evidence that there is environmental weeds and as it is in the map biodiversity overlay. I believe it's important that we do um, uh, achieve the overall outcomes. Um, and the overall outcome for the biodiversity overlay is that uh, waterways and wetlands overlocated is to protect, rehabilitate, and enhance ecologically important areas and improve connectivity and ecological linkages across the Mercer Shire. So this is probably the uh, a action that is reasonable and relevant for the scale of development being proposed. We're not asking for any plantings, we're just asking uh, for good stewardship of those areas, which will um, help to enhance the ecological, import, ecologically important areas as the code requires. I have a question of staff. How large is this, this area covered by the biodiversity overlay? Uh, it's, the site has an area of, um, what, 39 hectares? Just to Approximately 39.8 hectares, so it's a large, large site, um, and I'd estimate probably half of the site. Oh, yes, at probably least. half. Yeah. At least half of the site is covered by uh, the biodiversity overlay, including the riparian. So 19 hectares is covered by the biodiversity. At overlay. least, yep. So which is 19, so 19 hectares. It's 190,000 square meters. Is it not? Yes. Oh, sorry. 19 hectares, 190,000 square metres. I think the site's only just under four hectares in size. I'll leave it Am I right there? It's 39,870 square metres. So that's four hectares. That's the yeah. entirety of the two blocks. Yeah, good Sorry. point. <laughs> so the land area is 39,870 yeah. square metres, which is 3.9 hectares. Yes, that's right. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I've put an extra zero there. Thank you. I was <laughs> needing a defeat. <laughs> so roughly two hectares of that, that's what Kerry's saying, would be covered by yeah. yeah. And would an active management program take the form of a, a VCA or... Um, no. What, what does that mean? No, it, it would just mean a program of how regularly, you know, there's different types of weeds on the property, and so there'd be a different treatment plan for the, the types of weeds, I would imagine, and then we would specify a time frame of how regularly they would need to go in and actively... And how, the weeds. Is, is it, is it, um, how usual is it for a council to impose this mm. sort of regime mm. on private property through a town planning application? Um, uh, these sorts of conditions are imposed uh, by our offices and council on developments in the hinterland, particularly for um, proposals that involve rural cabins and the like, where you're putting a number of people on the site. Um, obviously, we haven't dealt with a short-term accommodation use in the hinterland yet, so this this is new, I guess, for mm. the council to consider, and it's one we need to think about whether it is reasonable and relevant to impose on the applicant. And how would the, the conditions of the active management program be worked out? What is it likely to involve? How, how onerous is it? Um, what, what would be a minimum requirement? Uh, well, I'm not an ecologist to know exactly, but I, I can only sort of reiterate what I've said in that the first step would be identifying all the environmental weeds on the site and looking at the best form of treating and managing those weeds. Um, it is a very steep site, so it's going to they'll have difficulties in getting access into the site. Um, I imagine um, that may need to be done on foot. Um, I'm not sure the site's accessible by vehicle. Um, so it, it will be uh, quite some work for the owners, I would imagine. 
Joe. So, yeah, but there are pretty opportunities for uh, organisations such as Landcare to assist the, uh, the, the the property owner with uh, with land management uh, practices if needed. I would assume. Yeah, I imagine they could approach Landcare um, for some assistance there. And with regards to um, environmental wounds in the biodiversity overlay, and yeah, you do mention it's a little odd for a, we're dealing with a short st stay accommodation in the uh, in the hinterland. If this were a development application for this building to be to be built on this block. Would we look at applying the same sort of um, environmental management of the biodiversity overlay um, for this property? Sorry, Joe. Just so if, we were, if this was a development application, i.e. for the house to be built, not just to, to, to be converted to short stay, mm. would we look at managing the environmental weeds in the biodiversity overlay if, uh, if a development application for the, the, you know, the, the, the building to be built? Was okay. where before us? So if, if the house was located outside their mapped area by by the biodiversity overlay and outside the riparian buffer, which it is, yeah. um, then there would be no application to council. It would be approved by a private building certifier. What if it was a commercial operation, like a bed, a bed, uh, bed and breakfast, for example? Uh, Bed and breakfast is mostly accepted development now under oh, our new yes. scheme, so that wouldn't what come would to council. But if it was, say, for instance, <coughs> um, some cabins on the site, mm. um, it would come to council and uh, officers or council would be able to impose conditions around managing the environmental weeds on the site. Because it is essentially a tourist facility now. Yeah. It is. It is yeah. proposed. But I think what we need to weigh up is, in terms of whether it's reasonable and relevant, does this propose? There needs to be a direct connection with conditions and the proposed use. So does the use of this house for short-term accommodation warrant? Is there a connection with having to require environmental weeds to be removed from the site? So does it place any greater pressure on the environmental values of the site? I would suggest to Council the answer to that is no, um, and that it is an overreach. And now I've got a question. Um, the overlay code, in PO6 quite clearly states the biodiversity and ecosystem values of waterways, wetlands and gas riparian zones are protected by avoiding new development in the riparian buffer area and wetland area, it does that. Retaining aquatic and terrestrial habitat in riparian zones, it does that. Maintaining and enhancing wildlife corridors and connectivity along watercourses and drainage lines for native fauna, does that. Avoiding edge effects and damage from adjacent land uses, um, as long as there's not adjacent cattle, we can presume that there won't have edge effects. Maintaining stream integrity and bank stability by minimising bank erosion. We haven't got enough information to judge that. Is this a question, Bob? Yeah, I am. Now I'm going to it. Maintaining water quality through filtering sediments, nutrients and other pollutants. And then G. This is a performance outcome. It's not an acceptable solution. But G says removing pest species and replacing them with local native species. How can it not be reasonable and relevant if it's a performance outcome? Just because it in, it's in the scheme doesn't make it reasonable and relevant. So you still have to decide, as required by the planning legislation, to impose conditions that are reasonable and relevant. But if so a development comes to us and this looks is... Like getting into debate, Brian. Okay. Yes. yes. You'll have I agree with you. I'm getting into debate. I accept direction. <laughs> you, you'll, you'll have right of reply. It's a good fun to debate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll speak to it. Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't necessarily agree with um, with what's been uh, been said there by staff. I, I believe this is an opportunity. The the use, the intended use of the of the site is changing. We're going into a tourism use now, and I believe it's an opportunity through that tourism use to uh, look at um, the, the environment, uh, environmental management of the uh, of the parcel of land because it's part and parcel of being. Uh, um, in the new ethos of being a green space to come to with uh, with good uh, connectivity and uh, and I believe good weed management within uh, within areas that have a biodiversity overlay. So um, I support uh, Councillor Stockwell's amendment here. I do think because of the change of use of the property from a residential or a, a, a rural residential property to a tourism use that, uh, that within our planning scheme that this gives us the opportunity to. Uh, to ask the owners to do a little bit more. So I'll support the amendment. Mm. Yeah. 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 I just have a question. If this uh, goes forward, how is compliance around this issue managed? Um, so the condition calls for a weed control management plan to be lodged with um, council for review. 
Um, so it would have some time frames in there for the works. Um, so officers would need to carry out an inspection from time to time to show that those works were being done. Thank you. Yeah, Tom. Um, I'll speak to it. Um, I believe that this um, short-term stay here is leveraging off of the Noosa environment and the biosphere and people will come here expecting um, that that this is as, as nice as it can be, as pristine as it can possibly be. That would be the expectation of the people coming to that Airbnb because of the ethos of Noosa. And so I, I will support the amendment, but also this, this property has significant other um, things it has to deal with, namely the, the secondary structure built on the property attached to the house. That has got to go go before and be approved because it, it, it was an unapproved development. And then whether the garage or power port is um, too close to the boundary line is another one. So this property has quite a few things to do and approvals to get before it can even move into the short-term stay. So right now is the time to make sure that this property is consistent with NUSA values and, of course, with the NUSA planning scheme. And that's why I support the amendment. I just have a question. An ecologist report, will that go with the application to um, do the build correctly through the right processes? Does that go with that application? No, no. It's not located in the riparian buffer area or taking out significant vegetation. Okay. So um, they'd just be required to lodge building plans with the certifier. Although it, um, because the carport is so close to the boundary, it will come to council for a review of that carport in terms of the setback. So would that be a compliance issue around that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So one of the conditions calls for them to um, seek their building approvals before they commence their use to make sure these structures uh, are sound and have been built soundly. So the question, how come this is before us for a short-term application when all these pl other planning issues have not been addressed? Um, because we are required to decide the development application that's been lodged with us, so I can't put it on hold until they're addressed. We've addressed it through conditions of approval. Thank you. I'll speak to the motion. Um, I don't disagree with anything that's been said at the table. However, I think that the condition should be made as an advisory note. I go back to um, the report itself and I ask the question, is the condition appropriate, fair and reasonable? Um, and I just think that it's too onerous a condition to be placed on a development application for a material change of use short, for short term accommodation. Um, I do agree with planning staff that I think it's a little bit of an overreach and I'm hesitant to see this be challenged. Um, I, I'm going to just run with the experts and, and I, I, um, which are the planning staff. I, again, I, I'd like to see this as an advisory note um, that they consult with land care and council and understand um, their social responsibility um, to maintain the area, but I just don't think it's fair and reasonable to be actually added as a condition. So I won't support this amendment, um, amendment yeah. Um, very big. Uh, look, I'll, um, I'll speak to the amendment. Um, we are acting on the assumption that the owners mm. don't hold their surveyors and it's a possibility that this may not have occurred to them, that this will, could be part of a development application. They may fully intend to rehabilitate and look after their land well, and they may be in support of this. There are ways in which they can make representation if they think it's too onerous through the existing planning process. But um, to include this as a condition um, may actually be consistent with what they intend for the properties, for the property, and um, as Councillor Wegner says, um, it may even involve, uh, it may even provide the um, the visitors 
uh, an enhanced experience of the Noosa hinterland. So I think it's worth testing this um, this um, amendment and the condition that's contained within it to see, uh, and the, the owner does have um, full right to either accept it or make representation against it if they think it's too onerous. So uh, I, I will support the amendment. Mm. This is challenging. Given the points that have been brought up around the table, I do agree in principle around the amendment with regards to the transfer to become a commercial operation to line up with the ethos of the Noosa Biosphere and gives protection that the property's managed. There's nothing to tell us back today, is this person, yeah, how do we know that they're gonna manage that property? without any link back for the future to say we can have these issues addressed to look after the land. So for um, to test it, I'm prepared to support it today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Councillor Stockwell, do you wish to close? Yeah, I, I will. I think, to me, it's a mature change of use. Mm. So implicit within the planning scheme saying it's not acceptable, it's not code, it's a mature change of use, it says there's higher impacts than the house that was there. And to me, um, it is an obligation on council to ensure the purpose and overall outcome of the biodiversity and wetlands overlay code is achieved. How this motion has done it is by the very least that could be considered acceptable. So if, you, if the applicant was to follow the acceptable solutions, that secondary waterway uh, would be rehabilitated for 10 metres either side for 80 metres. Mm. Uh, if it would be the performance outcome, it says to remove pest species and replace with native vegetation. In this case, I've kept it such that it, they may replace with native vegetation, but looking at the site, that uh, removing the pest species is probably allow nature to replace with native vegetation. So it is the lowest possible uh, level of condition to achieve the biodiversity wetland, waterways and wetlands overlay code, but I think it's important that we do, uh, every time a, a application comes before us, look at how we take <coughs> those steps to, to achieve that overall outcome. Thank you. I put the amendment. Those in favour? Councillor Stockwell, Wegener, Teresevic, Finzel, Wilkie. Against, Councillor Lawrenson. The amendment is carried and becomes part of the motion and only Councillor Lawrenson has spoken to the motion. Anyone wish to speak, else wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Stockwell. Yeah, um, I suppose firstly to the to the additional condition um, for noise, I think that's a, a wise move. Uh, secondly, <coughs> overall, um, our planning scheme does encourage rural tourism, and I think it's great that these people are doing it. It's, um, uh, it's interesting in my mind that it wasn't the thought that you'd be converting houses to standalone uh, um, short stay accommodation. It was more about getting the cabins, etc. on there. But there's a range of different tourist offerings. Um, I think it's important that we do build, build uh, within our rural area, our hinterland, uh, the, the increased opportunity for people to stay there. You know, uh, I know people very close here have had a weekend in Kinkin at one of the beautiful short stay. Um, houses in Kinkin area, and it's a wonderful experience. And I think, uh, if the as far as the use is concerned, I think it's a, a great use. It's in a, a a very nice part of the world. With um, uh, I'm sure the visitors will love the road up with going through the creek crossing. And if they start, uh, if they bring their their mountain bikes, they can easily connect to the Noosa Trail by driving down Williams Road, down to Black Pinch, and um, some of the nicest steep rides are just in that locality. Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. Other councillors wish to speak to the motion. Speak to the motion. I yes. Um, I, I'm in favour of the motion, and I'm in favour of uh, Councillor Lawrenson's amendment. I think it's a really good idea to test this. Um, the um, when we give a when we accept a development application, we have one bite at the apple. It seems to get it right, and by the by the ten o'clock, maybe too noisy, and maybe car sound does carry to other properties we don't know. So I think it's very reasonable to give them a year to make sure that we do not do something we regret in the future that all and many other residents will regret around there. Um, it is, um, I'm, 
I do not believe that the interpretation of the town plan supports um, short-term stays in medium density or especially in um, low density. But in this case, in rural residential on 98 hectares, I believe that um, the town plan does support this use of the property as a short-term stay. It is very consistent with our desire to open up the hinterland to more business activities. Um, farming is very difficult out there. It's very difficult for people to maintain their property and, main, and get some sort of income out of it. We are supporting that part of it. We are supporting this as a part of our hinterland uh, walking and biking strategy. And we would love accommodation out there for those people that are taking up our infrastructure that we're building. It's for Nusa residents, but it's also very much for tourists with tourists in mind to bring them to the hinterland. And as of right now, I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity for businesses to build in, in the hinterland and, uh, and pull part of that congestion away from uh, the beaches. So I, I support this. John. Yeah, I concur with the thoughts of Councillor Stockwell and, uh, and Wigner there. I think um, we do get uh, some diversity in the uh, in the form of uh, accommodation offerings that we have. I think the hinterland um, offers uh, an experience for uh, for a certain type of uh, 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 tourist um, market. Uh, I don't think we're being inundated with uh, applications in the hinterland for this type of uh, type of thing. Uh, it's also in a on a on a large property, and uh, it'll be an experiential. Uh, Opportunity to uh, to undertake so I'm, uh, I support the motion and I uh, commend the uh, the amendments of both uh, councillors uh, uh, Stockwell and Lawrenston that uh, with regard to um, uh, noise and uh, and wheat uh, um, opportunities on the uh, on the block. Yeah, um, I'd like to add also that I think it's um, I support the amendments. I think this is. Um, new area that we're moving into out in the hinterland. As everyone has said, we want to support and we are supporting through um, infrastructure bills and investment of money into the hinterland. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that um, the desired outcomes for the amenity also of the hinterland, which is our environment, what people come for that experience, that we need to know that we're looking after that further down the track given the Kim Kim Quarry issues and decisions that were made in the 80s and how that's affecting what's happening out there now. I think it's good to be cautious around these things and test these development applications and short-term use accommodations moving forward to ensure that we are getting the best social, environmental and economic outcomes as we're meant to as local council. And so I support this today. Thank you, Councillor Pinzo. Councillor Lawrence has the right of reply. I, I think the councillors have eloquently summed up all the arguments. I'll be supporting the, supporting the motion. Nothing more to say. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll put the motion all in favour. Councillor Wallace, unanimous. Thank you. Um, the next item is the application for reconfiguration of a lot, one lot into two lots, and creation of an access easement at 23 Durham at present to Roiber. Okay, this was also discussed extensively um, last week, but there's been some developments since then. Uh, does anyone have a, a motion they'd like to move? If you want to go straight to the motion, the one on the screen there, I'll read it out. The council note the report uh, by the coordinator planning to the planning environment committee meeting date, date to June 2021 regarding application number RAL 20 of 9019. For a development permit for reconfiguring a lot, one into two lots situated at 23 Jeremy Crescent, Coroiba, and request staff prepare a further report to the ordinary meeting date of 17 June 2021, including conditions for approval of the application. I'll second. Second, second. Councillor Jerusalem. Councillor Stockwell. So, councillors, um, it is rare that staff uh, and councillors have different views to the extent that I have on, on this one, in the way where, um, once again, looking at the Biodiversity, Waterways and Wetlands Code and what it means to appropriately achieve the outcomes and how we assess applications. Uh, I have forwarded to you some information based on a site inspection and the review of all the online information available. 
as we, as I'm suggesting, we're varying from staff recommendation, we do have to provide the grounds uh, for that variance as a, as a, under the Act. And so I will not go through the great detail that I provided in writing to you over the weekend, but we'll use the maps. So this map here we're looking at is the regional ecosystem maps produced by the state. Uh, the <coughs> star is roughly where the property is, and you can see uh, the 12.34 that goes up to there, and that's suggesting that this site was once a wetland ecosystem. Um, with the, the longer description, 12314, that's a higher eucalypt-dominated um, system that is uh, adjacent. So if you scroll down, that's what was envisaged. That's what is remnant now. So it shows the whole site's outside any remnant vegetation. It shows all the area that's mapped within the overlay code is not um, remnant vegetation. And um, it shows that the link that the, the large track behind is vulnerable. So it's the vulnerable uh, suggests there's a, a limited amount of that type of regional ecosystem left in Queensland. The purple uh, to the right is endangered, so there's less, even less of that. So what we can see here is from the, the mapping that um, while the current state mapping and our own mapping shows this as a watercourse, um, to, it is actually, in my opinion, it's, uh, all between those two remnants are farm dams. It's actually a degraded wetland system. And that's really important when you come to think about what a riparian buffer might want to achieve. So if you move on, uh, furthering that, the state has mapped what they call groundwater dependent ecosystems. So this is suggesting that the vegetation, if it was to be nat natural, would be based on the groundwater characteristics. And at the bottom of the valley, and it gives further evidence that this is a wetland rather than a waterway. It's a lentic rather than a lentic ecosystem, and that has inference on, on what is achievable or what is maybe impacted. The fact that it's been dammed, and it's not just one dam, there's two dams on this property and several, I think, upstream from there, suggests that it is not, has got fairly low ecosystem values. Our biodiversity overlays and wet, wetland buffers are in part based on an assessment called the Waterways uh, Assessment Report of 2017 that was done by the Mary Catford Committee, Land Care and Systems of Healthy Land and Waterways. And they've got a prioritisation uh, matrix and scoring. And from me going through it on this particular site, it's a priority five if you think that the wetland can be restored, which is debatable considering the level of disturbance, or priority seven, which is the lowest priority of a waterway management. So overall, in this case, we're not dealing with the sort of high quality, high ecosystem value e ecosystem. So, and what we're looking at is a boundary that goes through with, along a dam wall. So if you keep on scrolling, um, that gives you the, probably the, uh, the overarching view of the landscape. And you can see that the blue line suggests it's a waterway. In fact, it's a thalweg and there is no defined bed and banks downstream of this property. So to be a waterway, you have to have defined bed and banks. This one is a low valley bottom, which would normally be in a Melaleuca wetland with sedges and has been identified um, in state mapping in the, in the wetland area as potentially habitat for the, the Wallum froglet, which is a, a listed vulnerable species, threatened species. To the left, however, that big remnant is also vulnerable and the species in this property uh, that you can see that the back part of the property is already regrown. There's several very old trees there, uh, a, a number of uh, scribbly gums, race mosa, and a number of uh, some carpet for mupper or, or, or um, turpentine, as well as a few other species. So I suggest it's a particular type of, of ecosystem, which is called 12314A, which has both koala habitat value and also has is known to uh, be the habitat for the threatened eucalyptus conglomerata. So in terms of achieving that overall biodiversity outcome, there is lots of opportunity for improvement here. Uh, the, and to me, that's what we have to look at in this application. Can we improve the, uh, and get towards the outcomes stipulated by the biodiversity overlay code, rather than look at where the mapping is? The mapping is indicative at a strategic level, at the site level, there is perhaps other opportunities. So if we go on, um, the next map just shows that this area 
is in the Kuala Priority area, which is a blue hatch line, but it's not a core habitat. It's not mapped because it's not a remnant. It's having significant koala values, but it does show that increasing connectivity towards the rear of the property will have benefits of, of you know, achieving that outcome of increased connectivity. So there's two, um, two performance outcomes in the biodiversity overlay code. One says PO5, development is designed and operated to maintain and enhance connectivity between and across ecological important areas and connect habitat and support unimpeded and safe movement of terrestrial and aquatic fauna. And PO6, which we were just talking about, I won't read them out again, but that's about the biodiversity ecosystem values of wetlands, waterways and adjacent rock area zones are protected, including a range of different strategies. So what I've suggested is the fact that a boundary goes through an existing farm dam across the wetland does not have any significant ecological impact. The, if we were to identify the house site at the front of the block, which is a much logical place, the chances of having an extra household of having any significant impacts. Um, there's certainly a groundwater dominated system will take decades to get from the front of this property to the back. And the uh, improvements by rehabilitating this area will actually have a much higher buffer, like buffer function, so improving water quality. However, I'm suggesting that rear part linking up to the remnant, that that would add significant benefit from the perspective of achieving the outcome of the biodiversity overlay code. And uh, hence, um, it's my view that in all these things, we should look at achieving the planning outcome. Um, but we have to be very mindful of not creating precedent. So that's why I went to such an extent to uh, write out all the thoughts, because there'll be other times where a boundary or boundaries through a water course will have impact and will be a, a, a counterproductive development. In this case, I think um, there is a high likelihood that if we can condition the development appropriately, that there's a much stronger chance of achieving the outcomes of the code. Just a question, Brian. Did you mention Thalweb? I did. Could that you was for you. Explain what the Thalweb <laughs> is for the, those that don't know. So Thalweb, uh, where, the, where they mark the waterline is actually the centre of the valley. So normally the, the, the centre of a watercourse is the Thalweb, but also in this case, because the wetland is just the lowest point of the landscape, uh, and I suppose one thing I didn't mention, when I'm looking at this site, the four metre contour, which you can't quite pick up, it's just near that blue line on the right and just on the other side, that is the depression that would be most logically, you can see uh, four metres there and on the other side, that in my opinion is where the wetland would have been. And that's where in high flows, you'd probably have that as a ponded wetland. Sure, and, and like me, I'm sure all councillors are open to what fluvial geomorphology maps can reveal <laughs> about the great length of Ecosystems and Thalwegs. So all, thank you. All those were just for you. Yeah. And <laughs> Kerry, I have a question. Um, on page 26 of the report, it's noted that considerable time was spent with the applicant to explore alternatives. Was such an option explored? Um, uh, no, the options that officers explored was looking to see whether they could subdivide the site without placing a boundary. Through so the that waterway. was with lot sizes, okay. Yeah, so that it wasn't this option that's now proposed by Council Stockwell wasn't explored, just no. um, the other. My next question is: We've got Council Stockwell's opinion, um, we've got a council recommendation, and we also have the applicant who submits that the propo the proposal they put to council. Um, offers substantial benefit to the waterways and ecosystems. Um, who's right? Oh. I'm the that council. That's up to you to determine. Oh. <laughs> so my next question is, are we outside our jurisdictional power um, to be making such reports? Well, um, I think council needs to make a decision on this application. It's a code accessible application, so yep. we have a time frame in which to make it, otherwise it's deemed approved. Um, so officers will put forward um, their recommendation and an assessment against the scheme, uh, but it's really for council to decide. Um, I think, uh, as Councillor Stockwell has indicated, and officers have as well, we need to be careful in this one um, because 
officers concerned is it will take a precedent. Yeah. Um, Council Stockwell's obviously presented why, in his opinion, it won't, but there's good reason for this proposal. Yeah. So any, if this motion before us was, was carried today on Thursday night, which is when the final decision is made, we'd have a report which would contain all the conditions under which that subdivision would be allowed to proceed, uh, or not. Yes. Uh, and we, and we would have the, um, the, the original motion, if we wish to, recommendation if we wish to fall back on that. Yeah. If we're not satisfied, yeah. the conditions are sufficient. Yeah, and based on the discussion, uh, that Councillor have had and Councillor Stockwell's uh, position on this, we would have some reasons why we were going to vary from Council officers' decision. So that's clear to try and um, prevent it being precedent. If the recommendation is approved, Kerry, um, will Council con consider conditions or, or consider how much um, how large the riparian buffer needs to be and whether or not the waterway needs to be more than 15 metres each side. Is that something that you will be considering as part of possible changes to um, relevant conditions? Um, well, officer's recommendation is refutable. So our, our position hasn't, hasn't changed. Um, we, would, we would try and base the conditions on the discussion in, in council as to what council would like to okay. see. I think the, the big question is precedent because um, you know when we look at this and it, it seems clear that Councillor Stockwell has a great idea and that it, it, that's what we want to see but, but when it comes to the overarching effect of this, and this is a question to you um, Mr. CEO, um, what what will the precedent be for the people, person next door, for the people in Kin, Kin, for people all over the place who have a similar situation would love to cut their block in half because you know that 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 sets the value up of property. It changes the it does this have the potential to change the property values you know in similar <laughs> circumstances around the Shire with this precedent. Good question. Um, the answer to that really lies in on what basis council would agree to. Uh, approve this application under what conditions and whether those same context or that same scenario would, would exist in, in future applications. So um, one of the things, and probably coming back to Councillor Lawrence's question, is that if the council wishes to make a decision on a planning application which is contrary to the staff recommendation, it needs to set out the reasons why and what's the basis for that. So that's why those reasons would need to be very uh, carefully articulated to set the parameters, if you like, about why this decision would be different to what has been recommended by staff. And that would then uh, hopefully or potentially then um, quarantine that precedent aspect to only that set of circumstances. Excellent. Mm. And that can be done. Yes? Well, it's not only can it be done, it has, has to be done. done. It has to be done. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Mm. I just have a question. Yes, Karen. Um, these proposals that are being put forward with the priorities A5 and 6 around the benefits to the wetland being um, rehabilitated moving forward, will that come under the covenant? You know, we talked about last week about the covenant link to this and it goes to the title. Perhaps that's a question to me because they haven't recommended oh, it. Oh, My okay. intent would be the area yeah. I've identified as the environmental rehabilitation area would all be under covenant. It's all under that cover. That's my intention, yeah. Okay. So. The property owners are comfortable with that? Um, I didn't negotiate conditions, but it was uh, suggested that they thought that was the best place to rehabilitate when we were on the, the, the site. Brian, a question to you then. Um, would they need to fully plant out and rehabilitate the entire area, or is it just parts of the area? Um, I think... The, to me, I, I did go into uh, a little bit in, in the information I gave you yesterday is the back part would probably have benefit from some augmented canopy species, but then as long as you're, you're keeping stock out and you're controlling the exotic weeds, the, the nest will be natural succession, won't be hugely successful. In the wetlands, I'm just suggesting it's the understory that needs to, to, to really be upgraded because it is already 
uh, going back towards a more natural state. But yeah, so the details of the rehabilitation plan um, or the covenant that will probably be the, where that is not there. But, but to me, I've tried to suggest the, that it's not necessary to, you know, uh, have to um, revegetate this multi strata vegetation, just that, you know, the back we're saying is koalas, so planting some koala trees, planting that, you know, having it as a, an area where the, 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 the threatened species, you could just conglomerata, can be planted, but, you know, adds a bit of diversity. To me, they're the sort of benefits you get from doing it. So a question I asked of Kerry before, probably better directed to you, um, Brian. In your opinion, um, is it necessary to for the for the waterway to be more than 15 meters on each side um is the large riparian buffer that's been conditioned at the moment is that unnecessary in your opinion um so i'm going to be really specific it's a, it, because it's a groundwater dominated system and because it's so degraded any further width is not going to add well, that's wetland I, value no so okay so that's why i said the, yeah, when i was on site i saw the slight variation in topography, which in these areas makes a difference to what sort of trees grow there. And you can see on site that you go from the Malaluka dominated community very quickly into the eucalypt. So to me, to get an, a, an ecosystem uh, recovery, it's really only that corridor between the two four metre co um, contours that roughly reflects where probably you would have had this, this, this nice wetland. And you can see what it should look like just up the road on the eastern side of Jeremy Crescent. There's a lovely um, remnant stand. And to me, in terms of water quality, because you've got grass, the overland flow is not going to be um, giving sediments into the wetland. And with the groundwater, the most important area to denitrify is actually in that area that's wetted right near the wetland. So having lots of tree roots and everything helps with carbon to denitrify those groundwater flows. So to me, from an ecosystem function perspective, yeah, that's all is required. Brian, just given we've... Um heard a lot about your opinion regarding this today. What informs your opinion around this? Do you have qualifications or? I'm an expert. I've got a PhD, a master's in ecosystem wetland and aquatic ecology and rehabilitation of wetlands. So um, the people who did the study, for example, are people who would probably look to me for advice. Thank you. And question to staff, do we have anyone on staff that is able to have qualifications that match this to be able to provide expert oh, advice. I don't think it's you know to me. I, I think in terms <laughs> I of the koala stuff. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. In terms of the back part, um, our, our ecologists would have better qualifications than me. I'm only talking about the wetland waterway area, which is my specialty. So yeah, um, aquatic ecology is my thing, whereas uh, I have had masters that include restoration ecology as well. But Connor is very uh, mm. has very good skills in this. So, yeah. I guess I'm trying to establish why then in the report or communications with staff that this was this discussed throughout those pre lodgement discussions or I think um, Kerry answered that the pre lodgement discussions really <laughs> focused on whether or not um, the one of their appraised the subdivision layout could be amended to um, stay out of this area in terms of where the boundary would go. That was what the conversations were in the pre lodgement or in the assessment process. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, I, and I acknowledge the, the staff concern about precedence, hence why I've tried to go to an extent to identify the grounds, which the CEO has mentioned is trying to keep the, the, the degree it sets a precedent to similar contexts in the future. Not Like if this was a, a remnant wetland, there'd be no way I'd be going down this path. Just for the purpose of moving this debate on, um, uh, I'll speak to the motion. Uh, this is it's highly unusual to have for, and it's not never done lightly to ask staff to present an alternative report uh, uh, <coughs> recommending approval and their recommended refusal. Um, it's not done lightly, and with the deepest respect to staff, um, I'm open to the report coming to us at the Thursday meeting so we can go through the conditions. Uh, could we have someone like, it, it would be great if we had someone like Connor Neville available to give his expert opinion when, on, that, on that evening? Um, because um, we will still have the staff recommendation to fall back upon if we're not satisfied that the, um, the ecological values can be protected 
uh, suitably by the alternative recommendation um, as opposed to the um, the original recommendation by staff. But I'm, I'm open to, to um, the report coming on Thursday night so we can see the conditions under which this may be approved by the council. Um, and I would be very interested in what the staff have to say about that, including Colin Ewell on Thursday night. So it's only for the purpose of uh, keeping an open mind. And I respect this is, we're asking you to do something under duress. So thank you. <laughs> I'll ask, a question, I'll ask a couple of questions if I may, uh, first before speaking. Um, Mr CEO, uh, the recommendation before, or the um, um, motion before us uh, requests a further report, including conditions for approval of the application. That, that, that by no means means that this uh, uh, approval uh, is forthcoming. It means that we've got a set of conditions that we can consider again Thursday evening. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So um, as Councillor Wilkie uh, alluded to there, we've got a... a, a We'll have, we'll have two options to uh, uh, to consider. Um, the question for staff: One of the things that we discussed at the or was discussed at the planning committee was one of the reasons for refusal of this is because a fence line, as I understood it, was considered. Um, all, uh, trying to get the words right, um, a fence line could be considered development under a development application and hence uh, could have clearing either side of that was one of the reasons that staff were reluctant to make this approval. If there's an opportunity here to um, place this under some sort of uh, some, some element of uh, covenant as the applicant has suggested here or other um, protection mechanism uh, and um, rehabilitation mechanism for the, uh, the back lots here without a fence line going through as part of that development um, uh, approval, would that be something that staff would be amenable to? So, um, at the Planning and Environment Committee, officers were concerned that a covenant could not um, prohibit a fence being built on the boundary. Um, the legal advice is that a covenant can do so, it can prevent a fence being built. Um, uh, officers still remain concerned about that because I think people feel they have the right to build a fence on the boundary um, and that there may be pressure down the track for council to permit that to occur. Thank you. Uh, I'll speak to the motion now. Um, having visited site with Council Stockwell and spoken to the applicant, um, the applicant has what, what one of the things the council may not see or may not uh, be aware of, there is a mobile phone tower in lease A if you look at uh, page 21 of the uh, development uh, of the um, of the report, one of the things that the uh, the applicant was very uh, adamant to uh, insist when that was uh, placed on the block was that uh, the access easement for that was to utilise the existing um, uh, driveway uh, of the adjoining block to access the property instead of going through the middle of the property. So this could have had. This uh, property could have had a road right down the middle of it to access that easement, but uh, due to the uh, um, diligence of the applicant, they insisted, uh, the, um, the, the resident, they insisted that uh, uh, other alternative means of accessing that lease in. So that, that gives me uh, heart that this uh, applicant has uh, the environment uh, as foremost in their, uh, their thoughts as part of this. Also having spoken to them, they, they, were, they, they appeared open to at least looking at other opportunities and uh, probably haven't, uh, through the, the period of this, even with a couple of suggestions, hadn't looked at, uh, at all the options and all the alternatives. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, pleased that they proposed an environmental covenant and I don't think uh, uh, some further uh, opportunities there for an environmental uh, protections uh, would be something that they would uh, um, not, be, not be welcoming. Uh, as Council Stockwell said, the, uh, the the value of the waterway here was challenging. It was uh, quite weed infested. Uh, it was two man-made uh, constructions with a, a, a roadway and uh, and pipe work across. To uh, so it's it's more of an overflow with uh, with flooding than a than a generally flowing uh, waterway. From what I saw, that was my opinion as well. Uh, and obviously obstructed by uh, by weeds in some areas for uh, for water flow, particularly Singapore Daisy in uh, in the northern por portion of the uh, the property. I see that um, we can get uh, a mutually beneficial outcome here if we work 
or, or try to work towards this. And uh, I said, I, I haven't seen the conditions that staff could bring for approval to this, and I, uh, I'm at least prepared with an open mind to uh, have that option placed before us, because I, I think this is uh, um, uh, an opportunity here to, uh, to, to enhance um, connectivity and, uh, and um, uh, have some environmental outcomes without um, uh, in, impeding on uh, the planning scheme is it uh, the planning scheme's intent with regard to subdivision in this uh, in this regard? So, um, uh, without apprehension, I look forward to seeing what the uh, uh, what the staff can devise based on the information that uh, Councillor Stockwell, with his expertise, has put forward, uh, and will reserve my judgment until Thursday night, and uh, we have that before us. Thank you, Councillor Jersey. Councillor Wigan, question um, concerning the tower. So, Joe, I, I completely overlooked that, um, th that there's a tower on the property, and the road, Joe, it, it runs yeah. right through the middle. Run, no, it runs, runs on the, the left-hand side of 11 there, Tom. You can see the easement running up the side. It doesn't run through the middle. It was proposed to run through the middle of the property, as I understand it, but the, uh, the owners of the property uh, spoke to the uh, tower um, developers uh, at the time, I'm not sure whose it is, and uh, and suggested the alternative there, which was um, uh, upgraded to facilitate access to the tower on the left hand side. There. So that that's a much bigger road on the left hand side. Uh, it's it, a more it's a more prevalent or prominent uh, access because it's uh, it not only services the property next door, but uh, but does lead to. Uh, all weather access to the tower as opposed to going through a wetland. So the, there's a much more substantial bridge, just like off off the property on the next property over for the big trucks. I wouldn't it say, takes a, a, it wouldn't takes say a, a bridge, but uh, yeah, certainly some pipe work underneath uh, underneath the access track. So the, in order to put in a tower, um, there's pretty big trucks that that roll over that area. Mm -hmm. um, so um, site eleven doesn't get the tower. Site ten gets the is the, the tower is still on site ten. It, yes. Yes. And the driveway for the tower is on the other side of side eleven. There's Which quite a bit of there's quite a bit of driving going up and down those those roads to get to the towers. Which is actually on property forty six. On property forty six. The right. Yeah. Now, Tom, you wish to speak to the motion? I'm just asking questions about that. Um, questions about the tower. That's just something I didn't see. And um, having uh, experience with these things, there's a lot of. I'm just wondering if that changes. So go ahead, no, I'll, I'll speak to it later. Okay. Thank you. All right, we've, so we've had Councillor Stockwell, Wilkie and Jurisivic speak to the motion. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? I'd just like to add, I'm looking forward to the report back from the staff. Um, I think it's good to debate this. I think, you know, fundamentally things have changed since COVID. I promote uh, more people around the table and getting good um, input from everyone. I have spoken to the applicants. They are more than happy to work with council on everyone to get outcomes that, um, you know, bring rehabilitation, they want to work with us. And I think looking forward to a future that we have to um, carefully consider all options on the table. So it'll be good to have your report and um, bring more information back for us to consider, especially given that the staff explored um, other options and not necessarily the ones that have been raised today in Dr. In. Stockwell, Council Stockwell's opinion. It's better say doctor because you come up with Anyway, so yes, thank you. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Uh, you want to speak to no, it? No, you go. Okay. Um, it, it seems that we, we've, the, the science that um, Councilor Stockwell is referring to seems to be pretty watertight. That that's, The question now moves in reality, in these narrow circumstances, are we changing the town plan through? The council decision versus the democratic process of voting it and going through the process. So um, I would, on Thursday night or before that, I'd like to speak to you about about what it is, exactly what we're doing here as a council. As a new council, I'm not quite sure the, of the legal impact of going against um, that the, the staff recommendation. What are the implications of that? And what are the implications to all the other properties? And as the CEO said, it has to do with how we write and, and, and you know the conditions we put on it. But again, this is all pretty new to me and uh, I wanna be sure to get this right. 
So, um, so I hope I look forward to, to speaking with you. And if any other councillors would like to join me in, mm. you know, going over this with Carrie Kirkpatrick, that'd be fine. But I look forward to, uh, you know, learning more before Thursday night. Um, yeah, just further to what Tom's just said, um, that's my only red flag. Will this case set mm -hmm. any precedents for future development? Um, that aside, I'd like to thank Councillor Stockwell for the extensive work he's put in in pr providing this report. Um, and I want to just put out there that um, there's no dispute. The applicant and all of us around the table, we're all got a mutual goal and the mutual goal is achieving best environmental mm. outcomes. Um, I've spoken to the applicants, we've all received correspondence from the applicants. Um, I thank them for their flexibility and willingness and their genuine, um, their genuine intent to achieve the best environmental outcomes. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the report on Thursday. Thank you. Councillor Stockwell, you used to call? No. Yeah. I'll put the, um, the, the motion to the vote. All in favour? That's unanimous. It's carried. Um, Councillors, um, there's a couple of items, three and four, which involve legal advice, um, which we may wish to dis uh, discuss uh, in a confidential session. If it's all right with you, yes? Yeah, I'll move it. Uh, the Chair can actually... I can do it. Yeah, the Chair can decide to shift items from the order of business if you want to. Yeah, I'm... I'm um, section 20. Thank you, Mr. C. I'm, I'm proposing that we move items three and four to the end of the, uh, the agenda and deal with them then and make the decision in open session after the confidential session, if that's OK with you. So, um, Kerry and Patrick, we'll, we'll let you know when we need you. And at this juncture, if it's OK, five minute break, please. Yes.
Oh, good chair when you're ready. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. We're up to item five, which is the Noosa Bushland Reserve Strategic Management Plan, referred from the Planning and Environment Committee agenda. Um, welcome, Craig and Michael, councillors. Um, again, this was discussed quite extensively last week. If someone care to move to a, um, a motion, we can have questions as part of that as we go. Uh, do you want to ask a question? question? Yeah, so at the meeting last Tuesday, we were talking about the desirability of including some words uh, to reflect, uh, I suppose, to provide an explanation in terms of the prioritisation from a coastal management perspective is something that will occur in the coastal portfolio management plan rather than in this plan. Uh, have you had a chance to draft those up or is it something that you'll need till Thursday? To... Uh, we've, we've drafted up some uh, some wording but we're unable to do it in time to present a further report to this committee. So if council wants to consider that revised wording, it'll have to be as part of a further report to the ordinary meeting. That's fine. Alright. So can I move accordingly? Yep. Does the matter be deferred to consideration until Thursday's ordinary meeting? I'll second that. Do we need to give a reason in order to give start time to yeah. Yeah. Uh, to prepare the report? Mm. Addressing, uh, addressing um, the, 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 the mechanisms by which coastal foreshores will be prioritised for management action. Okay. Good enough. Coastal foreshores, is that the right wording? Coastal foreshore reserves? Yes. Bush, bush reserves? Bushland reserves. Yeah. Beach reserves. Bushland bush reserves. reserves. Bushland reserves yeah. rather than the beach itself. That's yeah. why I was trying to clarify. Okay. That's it, I'll say good night. Okay. Moves Councillor Stockwell, second to Councillor Drusevic. Okay, Brian. Oh, I, as I said, my we, we received a range of submissions uh, from those groups questioning why uh, they didn't get us a as high a priority as they thought was required. Mm. I think staff explained that the prioritisation was in the draft strategic management plan uh, based on ecosystem values and that uh, even if we did include a range of ecosystem service uh, functions in the prioritisation that because uh, those coastal uh, foreshore bushland reserves have so many pressures in the way of existing weed problems and uh, neighbouring impacts, etc., that the likelihood of success of returning those ecosystems to a um, you know, undisturbed type uh, system is low, and therefore it's unlikely to change the priority in this plan. But we recognise that the importance of maintaining native vegetation on our dunes is critical for our uh, our response to the threat of. Uh, coastal storms and, and, and erosion. So putting a bit of an explanation around that is what is proposed so that it's clear. Question for the CEO. Mr CEO, with regard to consistency across all of our management plans and, uh, and actions, um, shouldn't they have an element of consistency in the messaging they're having? If, if one plan says one thing and another plan prioritises a different area, shouldn't that Shouldn't the prioritisation become consistent across our plan? Yes. <laughs> so to further that, um, should there be reference, and I've had this conversation with you, Craig, mm -hmm. um, just our declaration with climate emergency, our um, we should align also with the Noosa biosphere. Um, I, I, I'm still questioning the criteria and the amount that was weighted for social value. Um, and the question I ask of you today, Craig, is um, have we factored in the importance of or the interconnectedness of people 
and the environment. And um, is that fairly reflected with a 12% weighting in the criteria under social values? Um, look, certainly social and cultural values were both weighed in, which combined to 22% with cultural values as well. Um, uh, cognizant in our mind, this is, a bush, this is a plan for our bushland reserve network. The bushland reserve network occupies less than 4% of Noosa Council and is the, pretty much the only land that we have specifically dedicated for environmental purposes. Um, so in that sense, it's not designed to be a biosphere plan where we're weighting equally the role of people in the environment. This is very much for the very small amount of land that we've dedicated for its environmental values. So we felt when the prioritisation was done, it was appropriate on these lands um, to more highly prioritise uh, environmental values and biodiversity than it was for social and cultural values, but they weren't ignored. Asset protection, that's not part of... So So I'm, I'm going back to the bush care is on the eastern beaches. Um, their role is providing green buffers, um, buffers for coastal erosion and climate change. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also um, the opportunity we have not to retreat from our obligations as trustees for our beaches, um, which is a major asset. Um, how have we addressed that asset protection or is that covered in infrastructure management plans or should it be looked at under this plan? No, look, it's a really good point you raise, Council Lawrence. Um, when we prioritise for our day-to-day man -day management of bushland reserves, we don't generally consider asset protection, but it goes to the point of how I don't believe this is inconsistent with the Coastal Hazard Adaptation Plan, uh, because where that is looking at the way we're protecting all our assets around the eastern beaches, um, this plan is only a small part of that. So if we compare the way we prioritise our bushland management for example, on Noosa North Shore versus the Eastern Beaches. Um, the foreshores on the Noosa North Shore have an opportunity for retreat. The ones on the Eastern Beaches don't. I think that's a really strong case to put extra resources into the Eastern Beaches, whether that's just vegetation management. The climate has a uh, coastal hazard adaptation plan identifies a range of actions to build, build resilience, including managing beach accesses, managing encroachments. Uh, vegetation covers only one of them. Um, so it's not expected that this plan will do with all aspects of those coastal reserves because it's dealing with a prioritisation across a very large and diverse network. So the question following on from the question I asked the CEO um, is that um, once things like the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Plan are complete, will that mean a revision of the Reserve Strategic Management Plan to align more closely with that or will we just be referring to the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Plan for coastal foreshore bushland reserves. I think a key action out of the, the chat, can I call it the chat? I think yep. everyone knows what we're yep. talking about, um, is the development of a, a coastal foreshore management plan which deals with those specific issues that are related to those eastern beaches. So it'll be a supplement to this just for the coastal, it will, in it, your mind? That, that's right. Um, the way the bushland strategic management plan is set out is there are certain locations that require specific management plans. They are generally where um, our normal ecological principles and where the interests of the public um, clash. Um, examples are heritage parklands, where uh, the current strategic plan calls for a detailed management plan for that site, as it does at Noosa Banks, as it does for the whole eastern beaches. And can, in the current draft budget um, add to the community, there is a budget there to develop a coastal foreshore management plan to deal with all those things falling out of the chat specific to the four dunes in the next financial year. So what we're likely to see as a result of this um, uh, de deferment is that clarity coming through within the reserve management, uh, bushland reserve strategic management plan to refer to? The, the intent is to explain that more clearly yeah, okay. in the document. Thank you. Um, one of the, the quotes that was kicked around here months ago was, um, you can't improve something unless we can measure it. Um, you know that I've, I've been requesting uh, measuring the, the constant um, monitoring of, of the, the beaches, you know, through a monitoring system, and one of those could be drones or whatever, to, 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 con, con, to look at how the coastal erosion is going, how the planting is going to make sure that more paths aren't being there, put, put in there, that it's not being destroyed. Is, um, that, I, I, don't, I don't see it in the plan here, but is that on the cards coming up? Mm -hmm. so, Tom, this, this plan's about all of our bush. Yeah, I know, I know. Just, I'm just looking not, at the not about the coastal issues. Per yeah, side. yeah. But that, that's a microcosm of, of what you. It is, and the, the rationale for having a specific management plan for that whole eastern beaches would do would be to deal with things 
that are specific to the eastern beaches. Yeah, it's yeah. not to say that technology can't be used across our whole network. I think there's a range of different uses beyond just the eastern beaches uh, where we can use technology to better, better, I guess, prioritise the way we do work. Joe? Yeah, um, further to that question, that was, uh, thank you for breaking that because that was the, the next line of questioning I had. Um, unfortunately, the PDF takes three days to load on my iPad and I can't go to the specific pages associated with it, but in the, um, no, no, I need the, um, no, yeah, that's the other one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the draw diagram uh, measurement and, uh, and, and clarity around that, I refer to page 36 in the strategic plan and uh, Heritage Park in particular, when looking at the, um, the, the, uh, the diagrams here were around 2010 2018. Um, taking out the red areas, which is the parkland, uh, as opposed to the uh, the bushland, even though the the, the two are uh, have a synergy, um, there appears to be, uh, and this this is around the element of of uh, of measurement and uh, and um, acknowledging success or otherwise of uh, of the work we're undertaking. Over those eight years, would you? It, there appears to be um, a less. Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Uh, a, a lessening of the uh, the biodiversity or the um, uh, the, out, the the environmental outcomes of, of an area like Heritage Park. There, that, that there is less green. Okay, take out the red, uh, and more yellow and uh, and brown areas, which are very poor and moderate condition of. Uh, of bushland, how do we, um, through this strategic plan, how do we measure success and how do we uh, we ensure that we're uh, working towards uh, improvement and not uh, further de de degradation of uh, challenging areas like Heritage Park? I mean, to the point of Council Wigner, we, we need to be able to measure and the bushland operational assessments are, our, are the methodology we've chosen to try and measure. Um, we need to take what are those essentially quantitative mapping and turn them into a, a qualitative figure, which we can do mm -hmm. when we look at it across the whole network. When you look at those two maps, there's a bit of a mix. Some areas have improved and some areas have declined. Um, but even just as we look at that, um, for example, we currently have our Works for Queensland team um, working for us. They've been with us about seven months. Um, it was this mapping through the BOAs that specifically led us to target key areas within Heritage Park for Singapore Daisy Control mm -hmm. on the basis of this measurement we've been able to do. And if we can continue to do that every five years from all of our key sites, we'll, be better, we'll have a lot better ability to, when we have resources um, to be able to target them into the key areas. Well, so we, can, yeah, we start targeting the, 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 the very poor and the poorers and we work our way, we should gradually build to a, 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 a map that shows, you know, at least a moderate, good and very good increasing over time, yeah, well, would it, think. Certainly our principle is to start from our strengths and work out. Um, at, at Heritage Park, it's a tier one reserve, so it's been identified as having very high ecological values uh, and that will need a fair bit of further investment over the next few years to see continued improvement. The other element from memory that gets mentioned there is um, uh, illegal dumping, no, so green waste dumping within uh, reserves and uh, management of that. Is there much been, much been placed in, uh, in that regard within the plan? Following the endorsement of this plan, um, it'll, um, see, it'll signal to us that it's actually a priority under this plan now and um, we will gen we will generally um, start um, uh, ha um, having a lot better uh, ca uh, campaign on on the T one sites. Um, so there will be a lot more of of uh, adjacent landholders and neighbours um, e e um, interaction. So um, but, we sh we should start see a lot a lot more of it. In a lot more of an improvement in that space. So. Uh, I would take it that's an acknowledgement that a lot of the, the weeds we're seeing are garden escapees and we could better manage the problem by prevention in the first place than, Helping, yes, than, yes. than cure in the, in the final place. Yep. Thank you, Michael. Uh, both, thank you. Uh, Craig, a quick question. Um, acquisition of new land via the environmental levy. Um, has that been considered and how does council propose to manage um, given that already we've got 178 bushland reserves 
with an operational staff of six people and a budget of 2.4. Um, has that been considered as part of the reserve, uh, as part of the plan? Not as part of this plan. This plan is how we manage the land that we've got. Um, so obviously, purchases for in, uh, purchases of land for environmental purposes are driven partly by our environment strategy priorities and also by the conservation land guide, which get, guideline which identifies uh, which blocks um, are there for purchase. Whenever we bring an individual purchase up to council, we identify what the expected condition of it is, what the expected ongoing maintenance costs of it are as part of that decision. So for example, we'd be much less inclined to bring a block forward to council to purchase if there was going to be really significant future ongoing maintenance costs, or would balance that against just how high the ecological values are for the site. Can I add an element to that? And there was a change um, of the way council manages those land acquisitions uh, during the last term of council from memory, where um, part of the spend of land acquisitions and part of the spend of environment levy was to ensure that a management plan was done for the acquisitions for the first five years so that we did um, land management practices so that when it did come back to uh, our council reserves that the, as part of the acquisition that the land management had been undertaken or at least a plan of attack. Uh, yes, it, it, it depends on the block, but um, any block bought through the environment levy is funded through the environment levy for its maintenance. Which as it wasn't before general, we made no, that which change. It wasn't, which was a fundamental change that we made. That was why there was a concern yeah. about us yeah. essentially creating a rod for our yeah. backs over right. many years That's of purchasing okay. land and relying on rates to be able to um, manage them. Uh, I'll speak to the motion. Okay. Um, look, we have a, a motion to defer yeah. to Thursday night for a further report, mm -hmm. which will articulate the way in which the bushland foreshore reserves will be catered for. Um, under the, the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Plan and the Coastal Foreshore Management Plan, which has been um, budgeted for um, in the proposed budget. And um, we can discuss it further then if you would like. Council Guy, I'm in favour of this motion to move it forward to Thursday night and get the um, further information. As yep. am I. Yeah. Any other council to speak to the motion? No. I'll put the motion no. I, I, I do want to vote because I think no. there is some thinking to be done before Thursday. And coming out of the question of Councillor Druswick and, and the CEO's response and coming from the question on social values. And the thing, we've got two options on Thursday. One is we um, are happy with adding a paragraph or two uh, to the plan to explain where we're heading. And the other option is to go back and, and review from a policy perspective whether the prioritisation in the draft is the way we wish to go. And the draft financial sustainability policy um, this year has been proposed to say that we uh, invest in natural areas or natural assets based based on their biodiversity value and their ecosystem service value and this plan is saying we in our bushland reserves we're putting a 47% weighting on biodiversity value. Um, then we're adding some ecosystem service type concepts in there so ecosystem services can be provisioning you know things like making food production, wood and fuel but in this case, water. So there is a score in the prioritisation about the waterways, and that's basically saying there's inherent value of clean water through natural areas. It's looking at supporting services, which are about soil formation and things like habitat provision, which once again is biodiversity orientated. So you, one of the options is to say, okay, that's one way to prioritise, but then there's the other two types of ecosystem services that at the moment are getting a combination of 27% or something like that of value and they're the cultural services the spiritual aesthetic educational recreational value and what we're saying is well maybe if that should be equally as high yeah. and then the last lot which is regulating services climate regulation flood regulation water purification that to me is where the real thinking has to be historically yeah retaining the biodiversity of this has been really important but going forward investing in climate regulation is addressing an existential threat to humanity. So we have to be, be really clear either in the words or whether we ask some staff on Thursday night to go back and we revisit this from a whole policy perspective about those fundamental questions in the prioritisation which are reflected by the numbers besides the different criteria we've currently got in there and whether we want to go into that process again to come up with a different solution. Potentially, we might come up with the same answers. Mm. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, item six, Bushland Reserve Strategic Fire Management Plan. Peter. Thank you.
Thank you, Michael. That's one. Yeah. Are you going to be doing stairs? Yeah. 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 Okay, again, this was um, was debated um, and discussed quite extensively last week. Um, you councillors care to move straight to the motion? We can have questions as we go, if it needs to be. I'll be okay. <laughs> um, well, Joe, I'll move. Move, I'll move, Joe, move, move uh, Councillor Jurisidic, seconded Councillor Lawrence, and Joe. Um, I want to bring up the thing. I'll see if I've had any uh, comments in there that uh, I don't don't recall having too many comments uh, with regard to this. I thought it was a uh, a fairly comprehensive and uh, a considered uh, plan. Uh, fire management obviously has some uh, some challenges for the future. We're looking at uh, changes in our uh, in our financing of uh, uh, fire managing in our in our budget currently and being uh, clarity and getting a a, a greater um, engagement of the uh, of the entire population, not just the uh, rural regional areas, and I'm sure uh, many uh, many areas such as the Parisian residents will be uh, appreciative of the, uh, the amount of uh, effort that went into fire management to protect the uh, Parisian community. Um, no, I commend staff for, uh, for their work on this. Uh, I didn't have too many issues with it uh, personally, uh, and I wait to hear the uh, comments of my fellow councillors before I close. I have some questions. I, I wasn't present when this was discussed on Monday, but um, in the peer review report, it says it must be noted that the reviewers received no information after multiple requests from the Queensland Royal Fire Service in relation to the local government area QFIS bushfire management plan. My first question is, um, how how is that situation, in your opinion, impacted on the outcomes we're getting here when we didn't? The, the peer reviewer didn't get the input he requested from the from the rural fire service. It uh, it would have been nice to get some feedback from QFIS, but I don't think it's that that critical. Yes. Um, particularly around the fire trail standards, because there's always been a bit of debate about how actually wide the fire trails should be across mm -hmm. our network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that sort of particular feedback would have been nice. Um, but that's I, I think that's something we can continue to pursue offline with QFIS. Um, and the um, through that peer review process, um, I, I think I think what we've come up with is probably a fair and reasonable outcome. We, um, in terms of the fire trail standards, we we did a review of all the different standards across Australia, and this this seems to fit with with those standards. Um, and I'll catch up with you offline. Be able to find out the reason for the breakdown in that communication. Sure, I, I think they're just very busy, but um, okay. I think that's that's probably. And reasonable. the other one um, was consider amending council's matrix to include the consequences of multiple fatalities, and contemplate another matrix which better suits us. Which, if I understand correctly, he feels we are underestimating the consequence of and, and the possibility of entrapment and deaths resulting. Yep. Um, yep. So, did you take his advice and amend the matrix to reflect that? We, ha we haven't amended the matrix in, in that respect. Um, um, again, we've, we're basing our information on the, the state fire hazard mapping. Um, the, um, in terms of our, our reserves aren't highly visited um, compared to some places, like Noosa National Park, for example. A lot, of our, a lot of our visitation is really around the periphery of the, of the park. We don't get, get a large number of people in the centre of our bushland reserve network. Um, so I, I guess we made that call that we, we felt mm. that our our assessment was quite good. Yeah, better um, on the ground knowledge. Yeah, but reasons. but also noting that this, this the way the um, the fire management plan is set up is that we do an annual review of the risk assessment process. So over time, as we implement the fire mitigation measures, um, we expect those risk assessment uh, calculations to change. So it's certainly something we can consider. In the next phase of the um, the risk assessment, thank you. Having said that, Peter, one one of the things about our reserves is a number of our reserves are quite uh, 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 relatively small, but they are in amongst suburbia. Yep. Oh yeah, you know, the one the ones in Noosa Park, like Heritage yeah. Park, uh, Satney, uh, Harlow Street, and the like. Uh, fire management is still an element of uh, of need in those areas. I mean, how do we how do we manage those? Uh, 
those those challenges in those those sort of tight confines, if you like. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that's correct. It is a, is a small area of land compared to private land and national park. Mm-hmm. As, as mentioned previously, it's only four percent of the shire. Mm. But the challenge is that these these reserves are very closely integrated mm. with our with our urban areas, um, and and the risk risk assessment process we've gone through is that is those combination of mitigation methods. So it's things like you know the fire trail standards, the plan burns, um, the the fuel reduction zones where needed. So we've tried to look at that interface the best we can. Again, relying on state state mapping, mm-hmm. and say these are the highest risk areas, and this is the type of mitigation we have to put in put in those places. The other thing with a number of air reserves is they they abut and or join mm. state reserves or or national yeah. parks and the like. So when Fire management. We would. I would assume that when fire management is being undertaken in those areas, that we would try to add that connectivity when and if it's possible to uh, to yeah. undertake. It it is rather a, a mixed bag of um, of networks, if you like, mm. because some areas are, are very closely like they border national park mm. and large protected areas, and then there's other reserves that are isolated yep. and out on their own. So it's a real real mixture. So we had to go through each each particular reserve. And try and you know assess what the risks were based on that connectivity mm. and the possibility of um, yeah a fire moving through from protected area into into a natural area into a bushland reserve and then into the urban interface. Yeah. Mm. Okay. The other question I have based on the peer review report uh, um, uh, from the draft that we had originally, what changes, if any, have been made as a result of the peer review report to the uh, to the plan before us today? Oh, I think in the council report I referenced uh, nine changes, is it, from the peer review? So they were the ones in the yeah, table, yeah. attachment two, the summary. Yeah. So that, oh, that was the public response consultation oh. yeah. element. Did, so the, did the, the peer review pick up the inconsistency in capitalisation in your photo caption? Oh, peer review, sorry, no. part, point five. <laughs> point five is where you picked those up, Peter, is that it? That part, page 78? Yeah. So mm-hmm. nine changes were made. Um, so we did take on board the peer okay. review comments, yeah. and they're highlighted in the in the FMP. Okay, I guess I guess because they weren't sort of um, in red track changes, I didn't uh, I didn't read them as I read the report. I sort of mm. yeah. My apologies for that. That's all right. Um, in my ambition to get the fire management plan done, I just went in and changed it, and then I realised it needed highlighting. So yeah. Okay. Um, the the main changes are in the action plan though. So the the action plan um, is like. You know, 70, 80 percent. Principles didn't change as you see the, yeah. the, the actual specifics yeah. with regard to yeah. Yeah. Peter, have we addressed in the plan um, processes that look at um, the impacts and implications of bushfires to protected fauna and species? I, I'm thinking this as I'm thinking of the Sunrise Development application. Um, does this piece of work, does it impact on um, on any changes we may be able to make in looking at uh, mapping, um, protected species mapping and overlays in council? Because every bushfire changes ecosystems as we've sort of discovered um, with the Sunrise Development application. Is there an opportunity in this plan where we can include processes to address any potential changes to mapping um, and it, do, it does do that um, by default if you like okay because the the um, the plan burn program for example is based on the broad vegetation groups so they're the different types different different types of vegetation require different fire oh, right, regimes right, right. so if we can um, best utilise our plan burn program to bring it back to a, a BBG type, that will support those species, including threatened species. Uh, probably the challenge again is in, particularly around urban areas, the more populated areas, the chance of getting more fire than what you'd like and actually changing the ecology of that site is quite high. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that's something that's you know sometimes out of our control you know, from indiscriminate fires, or whatever. But um, by trying to model the, the base, the habitat that we're, you know, trying to achieve through our plan burn program, that will support those species. 
The, the next uh, step we could take, and it doesn't address it in this plan, is to look at some specific species. You know, and so you could look at fire indicator species. An example of that would be, say, ground parrots on Mercer North Shore. So we've got some very good research, very good information on how to manage that sort of um, vegetation and habitat based on research has been done. Um, so a fire dependent species, we, we could, you know, try and, uh, I guess, prioritise that area for, for works and try and maintain that habitat. Unfortunately, we don't have all, all of the research info, information we need for all the other species. There's, there's 116 uh, listed threatened species in Noosa Shire, so it's, it's a matter of then of deciding, well, what's our priority? You know, do we focus on ground parrots? Do we focus on other species? In a way, koalas are also yeah. um, dependent on you know, a certain type of habitat. Having eucalypt forest, which again is very much a fire uh, oh, dependent fine. sort of environment. Yeah. I, assume, I assume that would lead you to some sort of checkerboard approach. You wouldn't, wouldn't burn an entire area with a spe with a vulnerable species in there in particular. You'd burn a small section so that they could continue to live around it and as that, yeah. that area that area's been burnt in that year, the next year you may burn another section of that area and Yeah, so if we if we've got a large enough yeah. um, parcel of land part piece we of can, land, we so can have fire management units within that parcel. Yeah. So then we can do and, and that's what we do typically. Yeah. We'll do this this block one year, maybe this block yeah. a couple of years later. It allows for movement of that's what I got from the uh, that sort yeah. of diversity. For the smaller blocks we have to if we can't if we haven't you know, can't do that, then we're looking at a mosaic burn, mm. which we try and do as well for our small blocks, but that's where we're looking for a patchwork of, of um, burns. Um, again, to give fauna movement, to create a bit of diversity in the environment. The other element uh, with regard to burns is how successful is it as a means of weed management as well? I mean, do we, do we actually eradicate or can we um, um, limit or um, discourage weeds uh, by, a, by a plant of burn? Because it's the the native species that tend to uh, recover better than the weed species in some instances? Yeah, so we can use plant burns a bit like um, any sort of weed control in terms of like, you can either slash an area or you can treat it with chemical control or you can burn it. It's just, it's another method of control. Um, it's, it's particularly good for um, rehabilitation sites because after you get your, after you burn, you've got an ash bed yep. from the ground and then you can seed it, you can reseed that area you can or you get natural seed come in. So you're actually, you know, encouraging the, um, the natural regrowth. But and you can certainly spot attack the weed coming through. You can, if you see a weed, yeah. you can... Yeah. For really thick areas, you know, sometimes you get big clumps of lantana mm -hmm. that dominate the landscape, so we mm -hmm. can burn that out, opens it up, do a bit of weed control and then um, reseed it, yeah, or, or replant. Yeah. Excellent. Just a come to mind in terms of we had some very hot fires in 2019 2020 mm. did we have any learnings there that there may be some local understory species that actually require a hot fire to start the succession process or not i'm just thinking that you know obviously there is in victoria there's certainly the mountain ash requires a hot fire to to recede uh, to re-sprout i should say you know from seed but anything that's of interest, I'm thinking more of the listed species, though we know yeah. the ground power, and if you leave it too long between fire, you lose its habitat, but is there anything else that we've identified? It, uh, when we had the 2019 fires up at Coroiba, our rainforest areas didn't actually burn. We just singed the edges, mm -hmm. if you like, so it actually stopped the carry of the fire through the landscape. Um, but around those edges, um, we've actually seen some recruitment coming up of rainforest species. Yeah, okay. uh, we, we thought, oh, that might actually knock that, that rainforest back a bit, but we're actually seeing some, some regeneration there. So yeah. that, that was well, one. That's, I thought yeah. that was a typical thought process, that yeah, once, yeah. once the rainforest is damaged by a, a hot burn, you, you won't see it recover. So it's interesting to see it actually grab yeah. again. We hope there there's some good rain after the Christian one, but I know it was dry out. Yeah. There you go. One last question uh, from me. Um, the councils were unanimous in supporting the budget item to resource this. Can just refresh for the benefit of those listening. What um, what will that money go towards? What sort of equipment and personnel will you be using that money for? So that's. Did you want to answer that? Oh, can I can yeah, 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 great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it'll will have a dedicated council fire management officer with specific expertise in fire management. Uh, we'll be training a range of staff across council in control burns, and over the next two years, we'll be building our capacity to undertake control burns ourselves within council. 
one of the key challenges we've had previously and we envision um, having with this plan if we didn't do something different was the fact that we've been using contractors to do burns and they're excellent contractors but they're just under a lot of demand. Um, there's a lot of pull and on the odd occasion the conditions are really good. It can be really challenging to get them to Noosa as opposed to a bunch of other different places. So we felt it was essential to build our capacity to do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, it won't happen overnight, it's very specific skills, but we we've got a three year transition plan where we're going to start by three years time we expect to be doing the majority of our control burns on council land ourselves. Um, and of course continuing to work with all the other management agencies doing burns as well. So what you're essentially saying is we'll be better resourcing our internal staff to manage our fire, strategic fire management plan. We, the, the, that's our intent um, and I think the, strategic, the fire management plan calls for roughly seven controlled burns a year. We don't believe we could achieve that with our current system of utilising contractors regardless of funding. So this is our methodology to get us to where we need to be. Thank you. I'll speak to the motion. Um, thank you uh, Peter and Craig for this body of work. It's a tangible evidence that um, the council is proactively moving towards um, a more active um, uh, approach to managing fire on the council's reserves, which is only 4% of, of reserves, but um, it is um, part of this new council's commitment to be more proactive in that space following what we learned and experienced during the Perigian and Karuida fires in 2019. Um, so thank you for the work you've done on that. Um, the, uh, I know you'll be working hand in glove with QPWS and QFIS to keep the Shire um, safer from, and, and residents safer from fire, and also it'll do, go a long way towards alleviating the very real concerns that residents do have about the threat posed by fire, given that we are face, uh, facing changing climate, hotter, drier summers, and uh, a greater fire risk going into the future. It's a very responsible, proactive approach, and thank you for the work you've done on that. Um, any other councillors to speak to the motion? Uh, Joe, do you wish to close? I'd like to read out the points that you just made there. Yeah, I'd like to thank the staff for their time and effort. Uh, I, I think this goes uh, a long way towards our, uh, a better understanding of our uh, roles and responsibilities in managing our own bushland mm -hmm. reserves. Uh, again, uh, just to clarify, 4% of the entire Shire or 4% of all the reserves? The entire Shire. Yeah. The entire Shire, that's okay. So, so it's a 4% land uh, of the entire Shire land mass that, uh, that uh, we're responsible for managing. But again, we, we work in conjunction with all those other agencies to ensure that all those other reserves uh, are looked after and, uh, um, and uh, a great partnership with QFIS and QBWS in, uh, in undertaking that uh, very large task because we, are, we do have a significant amount of, uh, uh, of, of reserves in and around us and national parks and state, uh, state forests. But uh, um, good work, Josh, thank you. Put the motion, those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Now we item, move to item seven, which is the Noosa Biosphere Reserve New Partnership Agreement. Uh, hello, Craig. Um, this was discussed uh, last week also. Um, I had a, um, a motion. Well, Karen, did you want to, um, did you want to, Move yours, Karen, or you? Yes, can I move that? Of course. Or should I move, move it now? Or you can move it now, and you can speak to it now, and, and we can ask questions as we go. Sure, yeah. okay. Can I put that forward now? Just read out what the motion is, please. Uh, the council make the report by the Environmental Services Manager to the Planning and Environment Committee dated 8 June 2021, mm -hmm. and defer consideration of the matter to the ordinary meeting dated 17 June 2021 to allow councillors to hold a workshop to obtain more information on the changes proposed in the new partnership agreement. Um, okay, mm -hmm. and councillor second, second that please, for the purpose of debate. Uh, councillor Stockwell. Thank you. Okay. thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, after having done considerable readings and putting forward questions to the staff and the fact that the mayor is absent from the meeting, I just think we need to put that forward to get further um, information I haven't had time personally to drill down into what all that means, um, especially given um, the increase for four years of the contract. Um, and in the back of my mind, I'm always referring to the King Kin Quarry. We wanna make sure we get it right. We're making um, changes and we wanna make sure that this um, is, be is benefit to all the players involved. Um, so that's why I put the recommendation up. 
and councillors wish to speak to the motion. Oh, only a question though, are we happy that we've got enough time before Thursday? That's right. And is there time. an urgency in having it because it runs out in the end too? There is an urgency in getting it adopted. Yeah. Um, now, if you need to want to have a workshop, we'll have to get it organised before Thursday. Um, Great. Anthony, you you want to say something there? Can I go up to the... Yeah, please. Yes. Approach the bench. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but you've always wanted to say that. The only, the only not lawyer in here ever wanted to say that. <laughs> Uh, thank you, councillors. Um, I just uh, it, it is the timing is probably um, against us, and, and Craig has some personal leave for the next couple of days, and I'm conscious of the item before. Is there, there's some follow up work, so um, I think obviously the discussion will take place. Uh, we might need more time um, um, to, if we still want to do that that type of work a workshop, even though we've got the contractual um, obligations. But uh, concern on the workload and. Um, I guess from my point of view, there was a lot of discussion through through budget time as well, yeah. and um, the commitment here, while it's extending a year, um, there's no commitment financially on a year by year basis. Every year they have to, uh, you know, uh, I guess resubmit and justify, and report on a six monthly basis in detail. So I guess I'll just put that on the table for discussion. Question: With Craig, are you on leave from tomorrow? I'm on leave this afternoon and tomorrow, and I'll be back at work on Wednesday. Um, I, I'd be in a position, not going to contradict oh. my boss, but I, I, I would be in a position to hold a workshop on Wednesday or Thursday, given the fact it's not, um, most of the changes to my mind have been relatively clearly spelled out. Yeah. Um, they're not extensive, um, so it wouldn't be something that would require any significant preparation. It would be more of a discussion okay. around the existing report to my mind. Sure. Um, ask Joe, a question well, last question to the CEO. Um, uh, in the event that time is... Uh, is a factor here. I mean, is there an opportunity to have a special meeting and, and you deal with this this item separately if need be before the thirtieth of June? Yeah, there's always that opportunity to have a special council meeting. Um, it'd be good to have this um, put to bed, so to speak, because Biosphere um, will be looking for their funding yep. um, once uh, the budget is adopted on the thirtieth of June. Yeah. Can, can I John, ask? Are you, oh, so, so um, Craig, you were very a part of the the writing of the agreement mm -hmm. from the get go. From what I understand, you would. Yep. Um, you, uh, Rex, and Rod Smith. That's correct. But you were absolutely involved in, in, in the preparation of this document. I have. I've been involved in all aspects, um, not only in the drafting of working with NBRF, but also the liaison with our governance team, the liaison with King and Co over the legal review that was done of the document as well, which informed the final version. Yeah. And so a uh, question to the CEO. Um, I mean, this, this is our time to ask questions. I mean, if we had questions of this particular document, we had committee meeting we have today, Craig's in the room. Um, I, I mean, if I had questions, I would definitely be ready to go and, you know, then that's what we're here for. This, that's what today is for, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Look, I'll speak to, oh, Amelia, you have a question? Oh, uh, my question is, um, which of our councillors want the workshop? I'm happy to support you, Karen, but I've actually done enough investigation mm. over the last week that um, I don't require it. So my question is, um, what, what is the feeling? Um, the motion there is to allow councillors to hold a workshop. Um, is that required? Is how I'll be voting on this? That's, if, if I can answer Please, a, a yeah. question, I, I'm... Um, I'm open to that. I think so all right, councillors yeah. need to do what's needed to um, uh, satisfy themselves. Yeah. So if a workshop is what's required, um, uh, I'm happy to support that. But um, if there's time between now and Thursday for Karen to meet one-on-one -on -one with, with Craig, would that be sufficient? Or would you want all of us there, Karen? It's a question for you. Oh, I'm open to either. Let's see yeah. what the other councils have to say. I just think given the... Um, issues around community and this whole subject and what we're doing, we need to get it right. Um, I just think that the importance of it um, should give us more opportunity to explore that. I've put it up there, we can debate it yeah. and take it to the vote. Look, I'm, um, I'm, um, uh, I'll speak to the motion. I'm, I've, I've satisfied myself, it's a very extensive, extensive partnership agreement. Um, some of councillors have been on this journey quite a long time, but I respect the right um, and the diligence shown by the new councillors to want to get across the information. I'm happy to support um, 
the, the, the motion as it is for a workshop for all of us to, to attend to make doubly sure that we're all on the same page with this. I'm open, I'm open to it and I, I support the, the motion. Um, this is a question that, that I guess to the CEO, this is the first time that we've actually ever asked for this in the, in the year that I've been here, that we've act actually asked for another workshop in between the general meeting and the ordinary meeting. Is that right? Um, look, I can't, I can't recall another one, but there might have been. I just can't recall. It's one recent. I thought there was one recent. I thought there was one recent. There might have been. Yeah. 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 It, just, it, it seems very unusual to me that, that this... Um, so you're speaking to the motion, Tom? Yeah, I'll speak to the motion. I, this, I just find this to be very unusual, especially when, as Craig said last meeting, um, that this is um, more restrictive to the NBRF than the, than the agreement that it's replacing. It actually you know, it, it, it says year by year funding where before it was different. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is a much more restrictive document. And uh, so when you, when you read it and you, and, you, it all, and you ask Craig some basic questions, I don't see it necessary to, in this instance of, of this, yeah, I, I just don't see any need at all for another, to, 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 to risk postponing this to have a, a meeting for the meeting before Thursday. I mean, there, there's, there's lots of big, big issues. This is not one of them. This is a pretty, pretty clear cut um, thing. This is, I think it sets a precedence for if we didn't ask the questions in the, in the committee and didn't ask the questions in the general meeting, then we'll have a motion for a special meeting, you know, to, to, to drag um, Craig and the team in here again to answer questions that we should have had ready before. So I don't, I don't see any reason to, um, to have a further meeting. Thank you, Councillor Widner. Um, Joe, then Amelia. Well, given that there's a change from the uh, the previous agreement to a new part, new style of agreement, a partnership agreement, um, and that councils are requesting more information and maybe may need a workshop to uh, to get their heads around it, I have no qualms with this. I don't think it's going to impact on the on the timing of the decision in any way, shape, or form. There is another option if we need it. Um, with regard to a, a special meeting, I, I don't necessarily see it coming to that, and uh, I welcome the opportunity for councillors to ask more questions and uh, and ensure that they are comfortable with the uh, with what's before them before they make their final decision. I mean, um, I, as I've just mentioned, I, I've done a lot of investigation um, over the last week. Um, there's not extensive changes between the two agreement is probably what I, I probably want to point out to you, um, Councillor Kinzel, um, but I'm happy to support um, your recommendation to get a workshop. Um, probably my only criticism of the report is that um, it would have been great to have had a workshop before it came to Council. Um, but having said that, I'm satisfied that all my questions are answered, but I'm happy to support you. And I think having um, informed decision making is vital to the process. So that means a workshop in between now and Thursday. I'm happy to support that. Brian. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm quite happy with the proposal as uh, we've put up by staff, but I think there is actually benefit if, if mm. uh, even one or two councillors want to have more information to establish that they understand the relationship we're entering into, because we're entering into a partnership, mm -hmm. we're not entering into a funding agreement. Um, and part of that, like, to me, um, one of the key changes is we're actually starting to refine what we expect, you know, where we'd like NBRF to focus from our perspective and what we'd like them to do. So in terms of We've had conversations before about the role of council in sustainable science brokerage. And what we're sort of saying in this agreement is we see that as a valuable role that NBRF could play and that we might in the future ask them to investigate or, or, or try and get um, research partnerships or projects around questions that we like to be investigated. So it is important, I think, um, and if we can save it at the general meeting so that dinner doesn't get cold, I'm happy to discuss it beforehand. Yes, thank you. Councillor Finzel, you're Oh, no, nothing further to say. Okay, can I just have a question? So, at the oh, meeting... Sorry, no, she has... Yeah. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all in favour? Uh, that's Councillor Stockwell, Jerusalem, Lawrence and Finzel Wilkie against. Councillor Wigner? 
Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Craig and Anthony for your input. Very uh, much appreciated. The next item is the amendments to the commercial use of community land policy. Uh, that was referred from the Services and Organisation Committee, which was uh, there's a few minor changes made as a result of that um, discussion last week, if I remember rightly. Um, councillors, just to move things along, have someone care to move the recommendation? And we can ask questions as we go if needs be. This, this was referred from Services and Organisation. Services and Organisation. Yeah, so I'm trying to find the, trying to find the, trying to find the item. Page Thank oh, you. Okay. I should have known that. It was yeah. all my committee. I was just, yeah. just trying to find the recommendation. Go, hang on, it's not in the planning committee. Okay. Oh, no, wrong committee. There some suggestions made, actually. Minor changes are made. And, uh, so, councillors. Uh, oh, Amelia, moved by Amelia, seconded by... Councillor Webner. Okay, Amelia, would you like to kick off? Oh, and nothing. Um, I I think everything was sort of considered at the Services and Organisation Committee meeting. Nothing more to add um, than just thank you and um, just bringing the 2014 document to 2021. Thank you. Yeah. I can't remember who referred it. Um, I did. Oh, Joe, you did. Joe, you wish you've got some questions? Uh, yeah, look, it was it was pr principally on the uh, on the significance of the item. I think um, uh, I think the issue being um, uh, commercial uh, use of community land policy. I thought that uh, all councillors should be across it, and uh, and that, that if there was anyone that had uh, had any issues, it should come to to this committee. So that uh, whilst um, it was discussed at uh, at the service and all that, it just gave uh, councillors another opportunity to. Uh, to look at what I think what is a significant policy uh, before council, and if they uh, there were any concerns, they could address them here. Uh, if there are no concerns, well and good. Yeah, I apologise. I think it was Tom. You might have had yeah. some questions. Yeah. Just in the very beginning, um, the the goal in the background is so that uh, community use is not unreasonably diminished and the environment is preserved. And there's quite a bit of work going on in front of Natanya. On the, on the beach, the main beach. And of course, we've been talking about sales. Um, I particularly talk about Bistro C. And um, the, the forefront there, um, is that, are we looking at that as well, you guys, with this, in this policy? So, through the chair. Uh, Councillor, are you talking about the beach, the parade in front of the boardwalk? Yeah, the beach. The, 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 um, the land that the community land that has been that is used by commercial um, use, uses, yeah, outdoor yeah, so, uh, dining, yeah, yeah. Well, but, but also the barbecue that's well, behind a, a it, it doesn't apply to footpath trading permits. Yeah, this permit does not apply to that. So just that's just on page eleven there as well. Uh, what it does refer to is all of the other use areas. Um, so particularly the, the balanced part of the beach, and you'll see their policy scope. It includes freehold land, trustee land under the control of council such as parks, reserves, roadways, pathways, foot, footpaths, foreshores and bathing reserves. So in terms of Noosa Main Beach, roughly speaking in front of the boardwalk is the area that you would refer to as the, the beach area. Mm -hmm. Then it says um, the commercial use activity must enhance the visitor and local experience of the Noosa Shire. And of course, I'm a stickler for that because, as as um, Brian pointed out in front of Natanya, there was on public property a barbecue that the public was not able to access. Mm. Um, and and I believe question bit, question Tom oh yeah, question I'm putting a view yeah <laughs> um, will you I, I uh, will you be looking at those spots in particular? I can answer that one. Um, that issue did come up in the. Um, development application that was considered last year and there was a condition about that encroachment issue which sort of came to light as a result of that development application and approval so a condition was applied um, the other issue that came up was around sales the area of sales as um, footpath dining permit so the property section oversees the footpath dining permits and uh, dealt, dealt with sales permit to be reflective of the area that it was using within the road reserve there that's on the esplanade and the issue of the barbecue area which um, also came up 
uh, became a condition of the development approval. And now that Netanya is undertaking those works, that, that condition comes into effect. So there's a requirement currently under, under them proceeding with those works to rectify that encroachment. Yeah, because there, there, there's always a, to a, a pushing back and forth between private people wanting to move out onto public spaces and then the public wanting to use that public space that the private people want. And so there's that, that interchange and I just think that when you're dealing you're with time or asking a question. <laughs> yeah, just you, you are considering this. You are you you recognize that 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 constant change, that constant battle. Yes. Yep. Every day. You threw the chair and this this po this policy really speaks to that. Yeah. In that there about the need for balance. And that's what it strives to achieve. Yeah. But thank you. Just I had to bring that up. Um, I think my question's to the CEO. Oh, sorry, was I No, you first then John. Okay. Um in the commercial high use permit, the change that says will not be supporting you know, application received outside of the tender process will not be supported unless council identifies an overriding community need for the activity. Happy with that. And then suggests and agrees to amend this policy. My question to the CEO. Chicken or egg? <laughs> <laughs> what is, isn't that implied anyway, but yeah, is it? It's a chicken and egg situation, yeah. it? and, and it, to some extent that's why this policy is here, because we recently adopted those permits, um, was that last month? Yes. Yeah. So we do need to have the, the policy and the practice in line, so we need to adopt the policy. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. needs to be alignment at the end to be the question. Yeah, so maybe I'll have to think about the words for Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. The Just, so Joe, then yeah. Given that the policy, uh, 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 this is a little facetious, given that the uh, policy is the commercial use of community land, uh, why is it that the policy doesn't apply to full pass tri trading and dining markets, lease sports, ground sports, performance, commercial leases and events and non-commercial recreation use, by the community not profit or school curriculum activities when uh, most of those are commercial use of community land? Why do we differentiate? Well, through the chair, councillor, they're covered under different tenure arrangements, different policies exist. This is a specific area that we cover differently because they're different permits as well. So this 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 specific. policy is intended to apply specifically to those high use and and or low use commercial uses on community land. Correct. Only. Correct. That's I'm just trying to clarify why there was that differentiation between. Thank you. Amelia? Um, I, I think at the services and organisation meeting, I um, asked the question of whether some of our core principles, um, our corporate plan, human rights, local economic plan, um, all that can be referenced in all our policies, not just this policy. And I did get a reply from um, the CEO saying that that is in the process. Um, governance is actually looking at that at the moment. So thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Merely they wish to close? No. Put Thank the motion. you, guys. Those in yeah. favour? Perhaps unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. The last item is, uh, oh, sorry, it's the third last Thank item you. is financial performance report for May, the month of May, and which is welcome, Trent. The only one coming direct to yeah. General. Direct to uh, General. Welcome, Trent. Welcome, Trent. Afternoon, yeah. councillors. Joe? Capital expenditure. Um, I think we've taken a huge leap in the last month from where we were previously, even though we're on track, but was the only one that was potentially planning. How are we tracking for, given that there's a significant amount of capital expenditure due to occur in this month, how are we tracking at the moment? Uh, Councillors, there's obviously a significant number of major capital works projects that are either currently let for construction following tender and also under tender. So. Um, where in the vicinity of three, 3 million to go through this month or something? In that vicinity, is it? Um, in terms of budget estimate, yes. Um, a lot of it will come down to the timing of the capital works invoicing and, and whether those major projects reach milestone. Now, most of those are multi year projects, such as Hinterland Playground, Rifter Street, and a lot of bridge renewals. So, there will be a bit of scope there for. That's right. So, we've already allowed a lot of those in the, in the draft budget for next year. They're multi year, so they'll end up being carryover if we don't. Um, get that invoicing and that milestone completion of, of those um, stages of works in the next four weeks. Just a question 
Uh, when we talk about bridges, is the Wapunga Lane Bridge one of those? I uh, do believe that those bridges are currently under tender review. Yeah. Under tender review. The tender response is coming in the thing, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, I was just trying to provide some fun for the King Kim connection. Yeah. <laughs> mm. On page six, Trent, I note uh, under rates and levies, the tourism and economic levy is 75k below budget for revenue. Yes. Um, is that a result of the uh, changes we made for uh, COVID allowances with that? Or, but, but that would have taken in with the budget. So why are we actually under under budget there? Uh, combine, uh, we, we allowed for a price reduction as part of the, um, the budget. 5%. So it's built in there, the 5% was built in there. Mm -hmm. What you're finding that 75 grand is primarily in terms of what we estimated um, the business impact in terms of businesses that are um, considered eligible under the levy mm -hmm. to pay the levy in terms of business closures, um, temporary accommodation and, and the, biz the business activity at the time, pre-COVID versus post-COVID. Because mm -hmm. obviously when we put the budget together, we're using the number of household or the businesses and households in our rating system mm -hmm. during February, March, which was early pre-COVID. That's great data for tourism and Newsom for yourself, Anthony, to actually work out 3% drop in businesses um, that's taken on tourism. That's a reflection of the market, I would think. Trent, yep. It's, it's, uh, I'd have to, I'd have to defer that one to the, yeah, to, love to uh, analyze that information. Not underestimate what, what the cycle's done over the last 12 months, because obviously this is, um, both the July rating levy as well as the January. Um, now have to, we'd have to come back and do some more analysis on whether it's primarily been from the July rates issue or whether that's come back up in the January rates issue. I don't have that information at hand. But it's, it is, it'd be an interesting analysis, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Kim Chilton, so, sorry, the follow-on question I had uh, in relation to that. What, given the discussions that we're currently having around the, the current budget uh, discussions and uh, the, 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 the removal of the tourism economic levy, that uh, 75 below budget, what impact is that having on the, the amount uh, that is uh, uh, provided for uh, tourism and, uh, and economic interviews through Tourism Noosa and or the activities of, uh, of Anthony's uh, department with uh, regard to economic activities? Does it mean Anthony's had a haircut? I can answer that. Um, it's the same as the decision that was made by Council to cut the levy in terms of the budget in the budget process, and that is there is zero impact on Tourism Noosa because their funding is guaranteed under the funding agreement. That's what determines how much money is paid. So any um, reduction in the tourism and economic levy impacts on other economic development activities that uh, our staff are undertaking. Um, and that impacts on um, Anthony's area, uh, but there's no impact on tourism. Also. Thank you, Mr. Lee. That was the answer I was expecting, and that's what I want to clarify. Yeah, and to, re to reinforce Brett's comment, through our budget process, as you know, the revenue and funding sources differ from our build from base commitments to budget expenditure. Mm -hmm. So any commitment for contracts or um, LEP implementation programs and, and Anthony's team resource, branch resources, they're separate discussions. All good. Isn't there another question on that, Councillor Tuesday? Sorry? No, Amelia, you had a question? Oh, uh, I always make a song and dance about legal costs. Um, interesting on page eight. Um, Oh, excuse me. No. Interesting on page eight, Trent, that we're below year-to-date budget. So we're in June now, and all those um, estimates that we're above what was anticipated for spending, we've actually fallen below. Um, is that how I'm reading that correctly? Correct. So yep. at, at uh, Budget Review 3, yep. which was undertaken, we did the, the work on that in, in March, and then I adopted that in April. At the time, we obviously reassessed organisation wide um, where we were year to date with our legal expenses, which, as you recall, at the time were year to date running over. Mm -hmm. um, but then looking at what was upcoming in terms of um, upcoming activity, appeals, etc., um, conservative estimate was that we were going to obviously exceed it yeah. significantly. Now, obviously, a lot of that's timing. So, we, we whilst we're running below budget now, it'll be interesting to see where, where the timing in that discussion is. in in six months time, because if the, if the appeals are still happening, okay. it'll occur in the next financial year. And there are some months coming out next year. Yeah. Yeah. Given, given those, those figures and those changes, are we just to see what the impact on the surplus slash deficit will be at the end of the financial year? 
Correct. Mm-hmm. So we'll, um, we'll have a obviously have a draft position in a month's time as we come yeah. in the financial year. I'll be, be watching the figures. With great, great, great oh, intent. Sure will <laughs> Councillors, we've got two items, confidential items coming up. Is there any other no. questions for staff? Um, any other councillors? Uh, no, I'll, I'll, move, I'll, move, I'll move the financial performance report. Be seconded. seconded. Councillor Lawrence, moved by Councillor Drusevic. Any councillors wish to speak to the motion? Yeah, well, I will, I will sing as I lose it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again for uh, another comprehensive report and uh, and uh, well, look what a good outcome for the uh, for the end of the financial year, given the. Uh, the circumstances that we've been under with COVID over the uh, over the past twelve months or more, uh, nearly eighteen months now. So, so thank you, thank you, Trent, thank you to all those that uh, uh, those that contribute to uh, a good financial outcome in this organisation. I'll finish with a question. Um, given that we we budgeted for a deficit this year, do you think that is it likely that we're going to end up with a surplus? Well, I'm not going to matter enough. I'm going to make that bit at this point in time, Frank. That's why I said, I'll, that's why I said I'll be watching the figures with great, great intent. What, you, what you'll find is we come in the finan- end of financial year, we have what we call the finance field of soft close at the, at the end of June. And when we get to finalising the financial statements in the year, there's, there's always a number of big moves. One of them is obviously take into account um, the refinancing costs of the QDC loans, which you haven't seen coming through the figures there, which is in the realm of $2.5 million. Um, and then any adjustments we need to make for landfill rehabilitation, which is another big one. But those two aside, we'll come pretty close, I do believe. Would it be fair to say we're in a better financial position at the end of the financial year than where we expected to find ourselves at the beginning of the financial year? Far, far better, Councillor. Thank you, Trent. Okay. Any other councillors to speak to the motion? The motion is all in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you, Trent. Thank you. Back to yeah. um, oh, three and four. We have to. Yep. Okay. So, a motion before us whether we go into confidential session yeah. to discuss Council's legal position on a couple of issues. Items. I'm happy to move that because I do want to talk about tax, which should be done in closed session. All right. Move Councillor Stockwell, second of Councillor Wegener. All in favour? That's unanimous. So, live stream.
All good. We're back live. We're ready to start again. Yep. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. We're uh, discussing items um, three and four. That's the Planning and Environment Court Appeal Number D one seventy six of two nineteen refusal application. 16 ancillary dwelling units at 64 Gateway Drive, Nooseville. And if we have a, a motion here to defer consideration of the matter to the ordinary meeting dated 17th of June to allow staff time to provide additional conditions for consideration by councillors. Move to Councillor moved. Stockwell, seconded to Councillor Lawrenson. Councillor Stockwell, wish to speak to the councillors wish to speak to the motion. All in favour? That's unanimous. We now have item four, which is Planning and Environment Court Appeal Number D102 of 2020, refusal of ancillary dwelling unit at 133 Gateway Drive, Nooseville. Also, the motion is to defer consideration of the matter to the ordinary meeting dated 17th June 2021 to allow staff to provide additional conditions for consideration by councillors. We have a mover, please. Councillor Finzel, seconded by Councillor Wigginer. Anybody wish to speak to the motion? Put the motion those in favour. That is unanimous. And that is the end of the meeting. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you.